Thank you for attending this evening to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Bell College of Business. We are grateful to the Charlotte business community and in particular to the Belk family for your continued support of the college and our students and faculty. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to NEXT. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Levitt and Stephen Dubner. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Thank you all for coming. For me, it is fantastic to be back in North Carolina. Um, I always get a little shiver of uh, anticipation because I came uh, to Appalachian when I was 16, and um, I grew up on a farm in upstate New York, and I was a total country bumpkin, which is partly why I was very comfortable in a town like Boone. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, every, and everybody there, uh, got, as they got to know me, they heard that I was from New York, okay? And in North Carolina, when you hear New York, you think New York City. And I was from Dwaynesburg, New York, it, which made Boone look like a really big town. And this was the place where I just let people think that I was that kind of guy who was from New York. And they thought I was much smarter than I actually was because they thought I was from the actual New York. They didn't know that I was from a farm town that was uh, you know, nothing compared to here. So it's nice to come back now because I actually do live in New York City now. So, um, <laughs> so because we're a two-headed monster, uh, let me just do some delineation. Uh, Levitt Dubner, economist, journalist, uh, Wears a pocket protector, often, seriously. Uh, wears socks that match. Um, <laughs> the biggest difference, genius, and slightly above average intelligence, OK? Just slightly. <laughs> but I am smart enough to know that if you want to write a book about economics and have it work and sell a bunch of copies, it is a really good idea to collaborate with a genius, OK? I am smart enough to know that. So let me just see by show of hands, if you're a genius, don't be shy, raise your hand, let me just see it. <laughs> I got one, I got two, I got two, I got three, okay, so that, that four. So that's not bad. So what I say to the, to, to, so to the four of you, you don't need to listen to what I'm about to say, to the rest of you, I'm gonna give you the, the, the single most important piece of advice you're ever gonna hear. If you wanna collaborate on something and have it work, find a genius with whom to do it. Um, you can't have him though, he's mine. I've got him <laughs> locked up. So briefly, let me just, we're, we're, we're going to just take turns telling some stories tonight um, about uh, a little bit about ourselves, about the way we work together, and then about the, the work that we've done. And let me just by, begin by telling you how we got together, which was about uh, six years ago, six years ago, seven years ago. Um, I, was, um, I was working on a book uh, that was about what I call the psychology of money, kind of behavioral economics, but mostly about how money is this incredibly powerful force that does a lot of things to us and that encourages or, or incites a lot of very strange human behavior. And um, I, I'd been working on this for a while and I was just getting ready to write it. And uh, the New York Times Magazine, where I'd done a lot of my writing, asked me if I would go to Chicago to write an article about this economist, Stephen Levitt, who had just won the John Bates Clark Medal, as you heard a few minutes ago. And um, just one indication of how not genius I am, I turned it down. I said no to the assignment. I said no primarily because I knew Levitt's work a little bit, and I knew he was a very interesting researcher, but his research had nothing to do with money at all. So it wouldn't fit my book at all, and I was selfish. I wanted to get to work on the book. Um, and they asked me again, and I turned it down again, and the reason this time I gave was because the reason they wanted me to go write about him was because he had just won this award. And as a writer, I never like to write about people who just won an award for two reasons. One of which is, they've usually won the award for something that they did a while in the past. And as a writer, I like to be in what's going on now, okay? The other reason that I turned it down because of the award was because usually when people win an award, they start to get all awardy on you, okay? <laughs> and, I, and I was worried about that. And, um, but as it happened, um, the third time they asked, I finally went because I was gonna be in Chicago anyway. And I downloaded a bunch of Levitt's papers and I read them and I was just fascinated by the, the very interesting, often bizarre, clever uh, research that he had done. And when I went out there, it turned out that he wasn't all awardy. He was like a really a, a, a regular, not regular, I wouldn't call him regular at all, but. Uh, <laughs> interesting guy, great talker with great research. And so I started work on this article 
um, which was a great, great deal of fun. As a writer, you could, there are a lot of things to write about, obviously. You can write about, you, could, you can write on the news, whether it's politics or crime. You can write profiles of people. You can write about sports. i had done all of that, but my favorite thing to write about is ideas. Because as a writer, it has a different dimension to what you're writing. And so Levitt was this kind of idea factory. And so for me to be able to look at those ideas and to expand upon them was a great thrill. I spent about three months on this article uh, for the New York Times Magazine, and it, it was really a delight. And then it was getting ready to come, uh, to come out in the Times Magazine. And um, I was pretty sure that it would be an absolute dud, as most things that most writers write are. Every writer will tell you, if they're honest, there's a period right before you publish something that we call the lull before the lull. It's, <laughs> it's very quiet, then you publish something, your book comes out, and then nothing happens. And, and even like your mom calls you and says, when, when's your book coming out? It was out six months ago, mom, thanks. Uh, so I was quite sure that would be the case with this article um, because look, it's an article about an academic research economist at the University of Chicago. It's coming out right in the middle of summer in the New York Times Magazine. It's beach reading weather, and this was not beach reading material. And I was, I was further convinced that the whole thing would be a dud when the morning it came out, the phone rang, and it was Steve Levitt's mom back in Minneapolis, and she said she just wanted to thank me for treating her boy fair. <laughs> and that was the only call I got all day, and I thought, oh, my, my expectation came true, and that last three months that I spent working on this article was the biggest waste of time I could have possibly undertaken, and just one more indication of the fact that I'm not a genius, I was really wrong. It turned out to be a pretty good move. It resulted in a couple of books, and it resulted in the fact that we're here with you today. So I took my turn. I'll give Levitt a turn. I'll be back. Thank you. So um, after my mom called Stephen, uh, the phone just kept on ringing. And, uh, and it was less to do with me, I think, than the fact that um, Dubner was clever. And he came and he spent three days with me. And in that time, he concocted an almost completely fictitious persona <laughs> that he would portray about me as a problem solver. And, and, and sort of the image he made was that you know, any problem that came along, uh, I would just kind of scratch my chin for a little while. I'd type in the computer, and this amazing answer would come out. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. It's uh, you know, completely uh, not the way I work at all. Um, but the thing is, people loved that persona. And uh, as false as it is, I have managed to milk it uh, mercilessly over the last six or seven years, and I have no intention of stopping anytime soon. Um, now, Stephen didn't really talk about the kind of research I do very much, which is, which is a bizarre kind of research. Right? I, I, I write about you know, catching school teachers who are cheating uh, you know, to help their kids pass their, you know, to, so, that the, so that the teachers don't get in trouble uh, and the school put on probation. Uh, I write about uh, sumo wrestling and how there's cheating in sumo wrestling, the kind of names that people give to their children uh, and whether that matters for their lives and you know, trying to catch terrorists and you know, all sorts of stuff that regular economists don't do. Now, it's not that I really wanted to be this kind of economist. I wanted to be a real economist. I wanted, you know, my, my idol growing up was Alan Greenspan. I wanted, to, I wanted to be able to make a mistake and have the world's markets thrown into chaos and, uh, <laughs> you know, and to really matter in the world. Um, but it turns out that reality often intercedes on your dreams. And for me, it, it, came, uh, it came early. Uh, uh, they did a, a survey of my colleagues. And they asked, what's the single most important thing uh, to, to succeed as an academic economist. And uh, one of the choices that was offered to my colleagues was a good knowledge of the economy. And it turned out exactly 2% of my friends and colleagues thought that's what you need to succeed in economics, which is why economists are so unimportant and so uh, you know, uninfluential in terms of making things work right in society. 70% said proficiency at math was the most important thing to succeed as an academic. But unfortunately for me, that is one particular uh, 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 claim that has never been made against me, is that I'm proficient at math. And it goes all the way back to high school. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, I was extremely bad at math. I had a, a math teacher named Mr. Drexel who, uh, who singled me out because I was by far the worst one in the class. And unlike the usual teacher who would just, when you didn't know the answer, would go on to the next student, he would just, you know, 
to stick with you and grind you know, the knife into your side, humiliating you more and more and more. And then finally, when, he, when, he, when you finally completely capitulated, he would ask the other people in the class, does anyone else know the answer? And they'd all raise their hand and they'd all know the answer. <laughs> so I still to this day have nightmares about my time in, in uh, high school calculus. Uh, but, and often in life, not often in life do you have the, the opportunity to get back at the kind of bully that Mr. Drexel was. But in my case, I actually did. Uh, I, uh, it turned out that uh, at my 20-year high school reunion, Mr. Drexel showed up. And he had been in his 60s when he taught me, so he was no you know, spring chicken when he showed up at this 20-year reunion. And I thought to myself, how can I get back at this guy? And uh, I'm not exactly a big guy or anything, but he was in his 80s, so I thought if I could just somehow trick him into going you know, out the back door, I might be able to take care of him that way. But, but I couldn't get him out the back door, so I, I tried a different approach. I tried the approach that my students use on me with great, great effectiveness when they want to punish me for, for my own misdeeds, uh, which is I'll be minding my own business in the grocery store or at the restaurant, and one of my old students will come up to me and they'll just say, Professor Levitt. And I'll have no idea who they are. As far as I'm concerned, I've never seen them before in my life. And uh, it's incredibly awkward. And they kind of, you know, eventually like lead me down some path. And we do an intricate, intricate dance in which I pretend to know who they are. And they <laughs> pretend that they think that I know who they are. And we just eventually part ways and try to make it, you know, as, as good as it can be. But I thought, I'll do the same thing to Mr. Drexel. I just won't be gentle about it. I'm just, I'll just stand there and like he used to do to me, I'll just let the knife go in deeper and deeper until he finally just has to completely admit he has no idea who I am. But I walked up and I said, Mr. Drexel, you taught me calculus 20 years ago. And he looked at me, as I expected, completely and utterly blankly. But then after a few seconds, he started to smirk. I thought, what, what is he smirking about? And he spoke. And he said, wait a second. Did you get a two on the calculus AP exam? <laughs> and I had to admit, I said, I actually did get a two on the calculus AP exam. And he said, that is the single lowest score of any student I ever taught in honors calculus. I remember you and all the memories of how bad I was at math came butting back to him. Now, I proved that two was no fluke just a few months later. Uh, after high school when I showed up at Harvard as an undergrad and they give you a battery of tests to figure out what, uh, what uh, classes to place you into. And the uh, placement counselor uh, went over my test scores and said, so in your particular situation, I would suggest the math course you should take is Math 1A, okay, the single <laughs> lowest offering at the entire university. And I took that class uh, and indeed I did get an A. Uh, it was the exact same stuff I had failed to learn the first time with Mr. Drexel, but high school calculus really isn't that hard. So you know, it wasn't that difficult to learn it the second time through. Uh, and I never took another math class in my entire life. I graduated, I got my economics degree, I went into management consulting for a few years. And then one day I had this epiphany that I should go back and be an academic economist. I had no idea what an academic economist did or, or, or what you needed to be one, but I thought, let's give it a shot. I applied to schools and com against all odds, I was admitted to MIT's PhD program in economics, and probably the most rigorous mathematical PhD program in economics in the world. And I was optimistic about this new career path I was about to take uh, and embark on, and, uh, and that optimism lasted about two minutes into the first <laughs> lecture as the professor scribbled all these equations uh, up on the board. And I remembered from Math 1A enough that, uh, that a, D, a D in an equation, that stood for a derivative. Okay, but the thing, that, the thing that was throwing me for a loop was that there almost seemed to be two different kinds of Ds. Right? There was a regular D, and then there was this like script D kind of thing up there. But you know, I'd never seen a script D in my life in an equation, so I just assumed it was bad penmanship. And when you look back at my notes, I just wrote D, 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 and I didn't worry about what kind of D. But as the lecture went on, I began to sense there really was a pattern, because these regular Ds were always right on top of each other, and these other funny looking ones were always right on top of each other. And I realized, as embarrassing as it was, I was going to have to do something. And so I finally turned to the guy next to me, and I whispered to him, I said, hey, hey, is there a difference between the curly D and the straight D? <laughs> and he turned back to me, and he simply said, you are in so much trouble. <laughs> and he spoke the truth. I was indeed in so much trouble. I mean, the curly D was a partial derivative, and there's nothing more fundamental to the study of economics than a partial derivative. Okay? I never heard of one. 
Uh, and never the thought, the concept had never even crossed my mind. It was completely foreign to me. And it wasn't just the parcel derivative. Every single lecture, every single week, some new kind of math I'd never seen was thrown at me, completely flummoxed. Okay, I worked incredibly hard. Uh, but the real reason I, I managed to make it through that first semester is because economists are selfish. Okay? And although all of my professors collectively knew that I should be kicked out of the program, it turns out that the way you do it at MIT, an individual professor has to take the burden of filing all the paperwork and going through the trouble of getting a student <laughs> kicked out. Because each economist was selfish, this was a collective action problem, and I managed to sneak through the cracks and make it through that first semester because nobody was willing to take the effort to get rid of me. That didn't really solve my problem, though, and I got back to, uh, uh, on winter break, I went back home to Minneapolis, and I pondered my fate. You know, what should I do? I mean, I was obviously had made a terrible, terrible mistake and was in the wrong place. And uh, as I discussed this with my parents, uh, my father actually gave me the one and only inspirational speech that he's ever given me. Okay? And it's a true story about what my father said. So as back when my father's a doctor, he's a medical researcher, uh, and after he had done his internship and his residency, he went to do a very prestigious fellowship uh, in a hospital in Boston. And uh, about two months into this fellowship, he tells me, uh, the mentor, the, the big doctor who ran the place, who had brought him there, called him into his office. And he sat him down and he said, Levitt, I'm sorry to say, but you have no talent for medical research. My father, what's he going to do? You know, he's sitting there wondering what happens next. The guy goes on. But there's one area of science which is so devoid of knowledge that even someone with your severe limitations may be able to make a contribution. <laughs> My father says, well, what area of medicine is that? <laughs> and the guy says, intestinal gas. <laughs> okay? And my father takes those words to heart. Okay? And he devotes, and I'm not kidding, he devotes his entire professional career to the subject of intestinal gas to the point where he becomes the world's foremost medical expert on the topic. Okay? <laughs> and just as an example, when I was in high school, uh, GQ, of all places, that's a huge two-page spread, a pictorial on my father, uh, and, uh, and the headline reads, the king of farts, they call him. <laughs> so my father says to me, look, I have no talent, you have no talent. <laughs> if you want to succeed in a profession for which you have no talent, there's only one possibility, and that's to take on a set of topics that are so embarrassing and degrading that no self-respecting member of your profession wants anything to do with it. And I thought hard about those words, and I realized he was right. And that's exactly what I've done. I've spent my life trying to find those areas of economics that are so offbeat and so crazy that no real economist would ever do it. And the amazing thing is that that has worked. Just as my father succeeded in his chosen path, I've managed to prove that maybe the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree uh, in my particular, uh, in my particular uh, case. So I don't know whether uh, it's more embarrassing the subjects that I've chosen to study over my career or the fact that all of you are in the audience willing to listen to me talk about them. It's <laughs> kind of a toss-up. But let me, let, Dubner, why don't you get into some of the stuff That's that we've worked on. So Levitt's uh, too humble to say so, but you do realize, don't you, that uh, his father's title makes him the Prince of Farts. <laughs> And I beseech you to treat him accordingly for the rest of the evening, all right? We travel a lot together, so, you know, believe me, I, uh, no, no. Um, so, no, that is off color, all wrong. Uh, so, so let, me do, um, let me do a little bit of an experiment now. Let me see by show of hands. Raise your hand if, um, after you use a public restroom, public toilet, you do not wash your hands, all right? Hoist them high. Even the geniuses are not raising their hands now. <laughs> All right, now, that's interesting. There were zero people, I believe, raised their hands, right? Let's pretend for a minute now that I am a uh, field epidemiologist for the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. And down in Atlanta, the CDC were worried about, let's say, swine flu or avian flu, and uh, they send me up to Charlotte 
because they want to know what the rate of hand hygiene is there because they're worried about this flu spreading and they know that hand hygiene, washing hands is a really great way to prevent flus from spreading. So they send me up to take a sample. I say, well, I put together a sample of like 800 people there and the great news is that Charlotte is totally cool. The flu is not going to spread in Charlotte. 100% of the people in Charlotte are hand hygiene compliant, okay? <laughs> now here's the problem. I would be very wrong. And, and, and the big problem is that I know that a bunch of you, particularly the men, are lying to me, okay? <laughs> and I know you're lying because there, there's actually a good bit of research on this very topic. That, that is the, the difference between what people say about hand washing and what they actually do. And I collect uh, some of this research myself, just for kicks. Um, I travel a lot, and I, I like to uh, do my research in airport restrooms. So I'll get off a plane, I'll go to the restroom if I need to use the restroom, and then I'll wash my hands. And then um, at the sink, I'll just kind of linger uh, with my notebook that I carry with me. And I'll just write down the number of people who are coming out of the restroom, and if they've used the bathroom, tick off whether they wash their hands or not. And it turns out that on average, about 70% of the men who've used the toilet after getting off an airplane wash their hands, and 30% don't. The point is this, if we brought the 30% of those non-washers in here and sat them among their friends and family and maybe professors and bosses, they're not going to raise their hands either, right? The circumstances under which you ask a question, or more broadly, the circumstances under which data are gathered has a lot to do with how reliable those data are. And if you're making decisions in your life, whether it's in your work or your personal life or your religious life, political life, based on data that are reported from people saying what you think, uh, that what they think you want, they want you to hear, then you're gonna make a lot of bad decisions. One thing that really appealed to me about a lot of Levitt's research was that it looked at data that was about what people actually did. Not what they would say they do, but what they actually did. So economists call this the declared preference is what people say they'll do, and the revealed or expressed preference is what they actually do. Okay? Whenever possible, what we try to do is write about stories in which there's data that represents the actual revealed preference, what happens. Now, let's go back to the hand washing for a minute. You can imagine that there are situations in which this is a really important thing, maybe the flu, but imagine you're running a hospital, right? It turns out that of all the people that are in a hospital on a given day, the class of person who is the worst at washing their hands regularly is the doctor. Now, what's strange about this is a lot of problems in our society when it's a risky behavior, we fight with what? Education. If we can teach people the better way to, to approach teen pregnancy or uh, drunk driving or whatnot, teach them the better way, they'll do it. But the doctors are the worst of anybody. Why? They're busier. They've got more intense patient contact than anybody else. But there's also this idea that many doctors have. A lot of doctors will admit this to you. One thing they learn in medical school, along with all the medicine, is to adopt what they call the God complex. It often serves them well, but it can be dangerous too. There was a, a study in Australia in a pediatric hospital where a bunch of docs were asked to, over the course of several months, report to the researchers their own hand hygiene rate. And over the period, they reported a 73% hand hygiene rate, which is not 100%, but you know, could be a lot worse. Here's the problem. During that same period of time that those docs reported 73%, those same docs were being watched by nurse spies who had been deputized just to literally watch them when they went into a patient's room. The same docs who reported 73%, their actual observed rate of hand washing was 9%. Okay, so anytime you go from three out of four people who say they do something to one out of 10 who actually do it, you know you've got a problem. And you know that if you're trying to solve a problem based on what people say, you're gonna have a hard time. So if, what's really interesting is a lot of the problems that we've been writing about, especially the last few years, especially in super free economics, are things like you know behavior, human behavior, uh, behavior toward uh, the environment, um, sexual behavior, financial behavior, right? The problem is when you ask people, you don't get very good results. And so that can be really tricky if you're trying to do good work and solve problems. So what do you do about that? Well, there, there's a lot of different things you can do. You can try to find data, like I said, that reveals what people actually do. But let me tell you a story about one way to totally circumvent the problem with the fact that people don't always tell the truth. You could forget about people. You could forget about people entirely. So let's say you really want to know about money and spending money, 
and the kind of attitudes that we have to it, and how it can be incredibly problematic. Why do people borrow too much? Why do they not spend enough and so on, save enough and so on? We spend plenty. <laughs> how could you find out more about what that behavior means and how it comes about? What if you bypass people entirely and go straight to monkeys? What would happen if you could take a bunch of monkeys and teach them to use money and then just sit back, create this monkey economy, see what happens in the monkey economy, and then try to learn something about people spending from that. Wouldn't that be cool? So there's an economist at Yale whose name is Keith Chen, and that's what he decided he wanted to do. It was a very odd research agenda. And when, it, when Keith would go out to lunch with the elders from his department, who were working on big macroeconomic issues and all kinds of currency and inflation issues, you know, they'd say, Keith, what are you working on? And he'd say, well, I'm doing some currency experiments. But he never mentioned the word monkey, because economists <laughs> don't do monkey experiments, OK? But he set up this lab at Yale New Haven Hospital. And, and so uh, let me just tell you the way it works and how the experiments work. You'd have this lab, and you'd have a big cage that was about, about the size of this riser that we're up here on, OK? And, and there'd be seven monkeys living in the cage. And down at the end, there'd be one little cage where one monkey at a time could come in through a door. And you'd do experiments just with that one monkey at a time, OK? So you got the communal chamber. It's called the experimental chamber. He wasn't allowed to do experiments up here in the big chamber where all the monkeys lived, only down here. Now, the monkeys that they chose were the uh, capuchin monkey. Capuchin is a very um, kind of a scrawny, like it's the size of like a scrawny one-year-old child with a tail the length of its body, OK? And the, the two important things to know about the capuchin monkey. One is that it is a sugar fiend. So if you brought it in here and, and, and let it wield out like a big vat of marshmallow fluff onto this riser, here's what would happen. The monkey would run over to the vat and jump up on the vat and eat like its body weight in fluff. And then it would stagger off into the corner and get sick, OK? <laughs> And then it would stagger back to the vat and jump up and start eating it. And it would do this all day long, which if you're an economist, makes that monkey an excellent research subject, OK? <laughs> the other thing to know about the capuchin monkey is that they're not thought to be what we call a smart monkey, OK? They are a, a new world monkey with a small and quite rudimentary brain, which means that they're not really even thought to think. OK, they're just thought to do, to be. And that's exactly why Keith Chen wants to work with them. He doesn't want to see what they can think about money. He wants to see what they do, what they're hardwired to do. OK, if the capuchin was thought to think about anything, it would be two things, really. Food, particularly sweet food, as I said, and sex, which you could argue doesn't make them so different from a lot of people that you and I both know, OK? <laughs> and now he wants to teach them the third important piece of modern life, which is money. OK, so the way this works is, Seven monkeys, they named them all for uh, characters in James Bond films. That's the kind of the, what monkey labs do. They always give their monkeys names. And the one who would turn out to be Keith Chen's favorite was named Felix, after Felix Leiter, who was a CIA agent. Not a, not a huge uh, character, but a significant one. So here's what would happen. You got to teach them to use money. How do you do that? You'd bring Felix from the big cage into the little cage here, and you'd give him a coin. And when Felix would pick up the coin and sniff it and try to eat it, and when he would see that it's not edible, he'd get rid of it. He'd throw it. And if you did it repeatedly, he'd throw it harder. He'd get very upset. So you'd give him the coin, and then you would offer some sweet food. And then Felix would reach out and take the food, and you would take the coin out of his other hand. And over time, I mentioned they're not very smart. It took about six months on average for the monkeys to learn that if you give a coin, you get food in return. But over time, they were able to do this. So, so Keith Chen has got them doing this basic trading game that looks like money. Now uh, that he's got this happening, he wants to see if the monkeys can express their preferences through money. Because again, economists are all about preferences and measuring them. How do you do that? In this case, it was a very simple experiment, but very clever. They offered a bunch of different kinds of food to all seven monkeys during these different experiments to see if the monkeys had particular food preferences, individual preferences. And if so, would they consistently buy them? And all the foods were priced the same. So what happens is uh, Felix, let's say, any time Felix would have the opportunity to buy Jell-O cubes, he always would. Turned out that that was Felix's favorite food, Jell-O. When there was other food for sale and not Jell-O, Felix would still buy it because it's still cheap. It's free. Felix isn't working for the money, right? So it's still free food for the monkey. And he's, for the money, he's not that dumb. So he would get the free food. But whenever there was Jell-O, he would buy it. And interestingly, all the other monkeys, too, 
had consistent tastes and preferences about the food and buying it. So now Keith Chen is thinking, well, this is really getting interesting. These tiny brain food and sex monkeys can use money in a way that we recognize, and they can consistently express their preferences through money. Now, um, being an economist, let me just say, it's not a perfect anagram, but sadist and economist are very, very similar words, you understand, and there's a little bit of a sadist in every economist, because here's what Keith Chen now does. Now that he's got uh, the monkeys th buying their favorite foods at a cheap price, the same price as everything, now he's gonna double the price of just their favorite food, okay? So what happens now is Felix will come in and expect to get a bowl with a couple cubes of jello in it for one coin, but on this day, he comes in, he gives a coin, there's only one cube of jello. So the price of jello has doubled, or the quantity is halved, however you wanna look at it. And you think, well, what, what will the monkey do? I would think it's a tiny brain monkey, it likes jello, it's just gonna keep on buying jello, even though it just got a lot more expensive. But that's not what happened. Felix and the other monkeys responded rationally to what's called this price shock, okay? Now if you're Keith Chen, you're thinking this is really, really interesting, because we would expect people to respond rationally when, when our favorite item gets more expensive, we might buy less of it, but the monkeys did too. So the parallels between the monkeys and us are getting stronger and stronger and, and incredibly surprising. So then he says, all right, well, as, as deep as those parallels may be, there's no way that the monkeys are as smart and as rational as we are, obviously, because we're people and we're always smart and we're always rational, especially when it comes to money, right? So he devises another little game that's meant to test what's called loss aversion. And loss aversion basically means that you attach a greater degree of emotion and pain to a loss then you attach happiness to a gain of the same amount. An economist would tell you, most economists would tell you, if you're being loss averse, you're being irrational. Doesn't make sense to do that. So he, he devises this little gambling game that's very simple. In each version, there's two versions. In each version, there's a bowl of grapes and a coin flip. If the coin flip is, comes out in the monkey's favor in the one game, the monkey gets a bowl of grapes and, the, and then an added bonus grape for winning the coin flip. In the other version, there's a bowl of grapes. If the monkey loses the coin toss, the monkey gets a bowl of grapes, then they remove one grape to commemorate the loss of the coin. The, here's the thing. The number of grapes the monkey is getting to eat, whether he wins or loses, is the same. Okay, and, he, and again, he's a monkey and it's free food. There's no reason not to play the game where you might lose unless you're loss averse. That's what he's testing. And it turns out that indeed the monkeys were very loss averse. The monkeys didn't want to play the game where they could lose a grape even though they would still get a bunch of free grapes. A at which point Keith Chen said, well, here's where we split off from them because humans would never do that, of course, right? So the monkey is plainly much more irrational than us and, and he begins to write up a paper that's something like, you know, the loss aversion coefficient of the capuchin monkey in captivity is 2.43, and here are the conditions under which this finding was reached. And yet, there were some other economists doing some other research with human beings, with day traders. They took a bunch of day traders and hooked up their brains to uh, electrodes to measure their brain waves. They were keeping performance journals. They were, the researchers were measuring the day traders' trades after losses and gains to look at loss aversion. Turned out that the average American male day trader in captivity was slightly more irrational than the tiny brain food and sex monkey, okay? To which Keith Chen is thinking, this is pretty fascinating. It means, perhaps, that a lot of our assumptions about how rational or irrational people are and why may be wrong. We may be thinking about the state of rationality in a wrong way. If the monkey is that way and the human beings are that way, we have a lot more work to do to figure out about people's approach toward money and what's rational and what's irrational. Now, if there were any further evidence needed of the parallels between the monkeys and us, something happened in the lab one day that was a very strange accident. What happened is they're doing the experiments just like they'd always done, and um, they bring Felix in from the big cage here into the little cage, and the way it usually worked is they'd give each monkey a little basket of 12 coins to gather up and start to buy food with. But on this day, for reasons that no one could ever figure out, instead of um, gathering up the money and, and spending it, Felix takes the basket and throws it back up here, flings the money into the big cage and runs in after it. 
So it's like a, a bank heist down here, <laughs> followed by a jailbreak into there, okay? And in the big cage here, it's total chaos, because there's seven monkeys and 12 coins on the floor, and they go for it, which, which further reinforces the idea that they really understand money now, because they really want the money. So Keith runs in there to get the money back from the monkeys, and the monkeys won't give him the money back, because they want to keep it. So he goes out to bring a bunch of food in to bribe the monkeys, which further tells them, oh, whenever we can, we should steal food, because the people <laughs> go out and give us a bunch of money in return for it. And they gather up most of the money that people do, but Keith Chen now sees one monkey who's still hanging onto a coin goes over and, and gives it to a second monkey. And Keith, the economist, is thinking, this is really fascinating. What's going on in the monkey economy here? Is it the repayment of a loan? Is it uh, <laughs> monkey altruism? What's going on? But uh, th there were a couple seconds of like grooming, and then bam, it was monkey sex. <laughs> this was the first recorded instance of monkey prostitution in the history of science, OK? And then to show how thoroughly the monkeys understand, I mean, talk about expressing your preferences with money, right? <laughs> to show how thoroughly the monkeys understood money by now, after the sex was over, which was about eight seconds, they're monkeys, right? After the sex is over, the monkey would receive the coin, takes it over to Keith Chen to buy some grapes with it. <laughs> I'm sure if there had been a uh, cigarette machine in the cage, it would have gone right there. So, OK, your turn. Well, thanks. So I'm not uh, sure how I'm supposed to yeah. follow that story. So maybe we should uh, open it up for Q&A. Here's a question over here. I'll repeat the questions if you have trouble hearing. How has your research altered your own behavior? How research question. altered my own behavior? I think that um, one, one very easy and somewhat trivial example uh, comes from uh, research that I was doing on real estate agents. And so um, I, uh, I had, I had for, for kind of a hobby, I was rehabbing houses. And in order to know which houses to buy, uh, and, then, and then later to study academic, I got a data set of all the houses which had been sold in, my, uh, in the town I lived in, Oak Park, Illinois at the time. And, uh, and I'd build a statistical model of, uh, of this. And along the way, uh, something very interesting popped out of the data. Uh, and that was, uh, made sense in light of the incentives because Although the, the, uh, the contract between the real estate agent and the customer seems to have everybody's interest well aligned. I mean, we haven't talked today much about incentives, but incentives are fundamental to everything that an economist thinks about. In reality, the incentives between the real estate agent and the, and the, and the seller of the home aren't that well aligned because the seller of the home gets 94% you know, of the value of the home, the other 6% being paid in commission. That commission's then split between the buyer's agent and the seller's agent and between the, the, the company the agent works for. And in the end, the agent only gets 1.5%. But the agent ends up doing all the work and also ends up paying the marketing costs. And so if you could, for instance, keep your house on the market for one extra week and expect to sell it for $10,000 more, I think virtually any homeowner would say, I would love that trade-off. Let me leave it on the, the market for a week, get a better offer, sell it for 10,000 more. But once you start dividing up the small piece the agent gets, they only get $150 out of that 10,000. And if they got to pay for marketing and do a bunch more showings, well, they'd rather get that house sold. Okay? And as we looked at the data, something really uh, interesting emerged from the data, which is that in, in, in uh, the, the MLS in, in Illinois, you're required to list whether or not you're an agent. So I can see when an agent, when a house sells, whether it's owned by the agent or it's owned by a customer. And what happens is if you start to control for all the other factors, the agents own homes uh, sell for uh, more than similar houses that are uh, sold by their clients. Okay, and you might say, well, that's just because the agents have better taste and they know how to you know, paint their, their house the right color and things like that. Okay, but the thing that you would think is if the agents have such great taste, their homes would fly off the market. Right? They'd sell them for more and they'd sell them more quickly. But indeed, it turned out that the agent's houses took much longer to sell than their customers' own houses uh, sold, which meant that the agents seemed to be holding out for the really good deal on their own homes, but encouraging wrongly uh, the customers to sell their homes too quickly. Okay, so having observed this, I got to think more and more about the incentives that agents had. And so as I looked to buy the next home we're going to rehab, uh, I saw an interest in looking home and I figured, uh, what better way than to be direct? And I, I, uh, I called up the agent who was listing that house. And I said to her, hey, I'm interested in the house. 
I just need you to tell me what the lowest possible offer that your client would be willing to accept. Okay? And she said to me, oh, that, that is absolute violation of the principles of, of, of realtors, and uh, I can't believe you would ask me such a, a disgraceful question, and you should be ashamed of yourself. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, I just figured it. I'd give it a shot. Anyway, maybe you can tell me a little bit more about the property, blah, 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 blah. So, so we talked about the house for about five minutes. And then at the end of the call, I said, well, that's great. You know, I'd like to come take a look at it. So what's well, one more thing I want to throw in? Uh, my client's actually willing to sell this house for lower than you would possibly believe. <laughs> and so I made an offer that was $50,000 lower than the offer that I was about to make otherwise. And the uh, seller uh, took the offer without any counter uh, negotiation. And basically, because of my understanding of incentives, uh, uh, I was able to essentially, or the, really the real estate agent did it for me, stole $50,000 from her client, put it directly into my pocket. So those are the kind of things I like to do with my research uh, <laughs> when I apply them to my own, uh, to my own life. All right, now, any other questions? Yes, please. Supposedly universal economic behaviors were actually culturally specific, certain um, behaviors that um, and the mainstream, I assume, are just universal, but are actually yeah. Western, which I find a lot. Yeah. I, I, you want me to take that one? Or yeah. You want to take uh, yeah, yeah. 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 There's actually a great, there's, there's a great, great example of that, actually. So um, <clears throat> more and more economists have turned to lab experiments, you know, bringing college students into a lab uh, like psychologists have done for, for, you know, generations. But it's very new to economists. And, and economists, uh, as often happens when a new discipline adopts uh, uh, or, or borrows uh, a, a mechanism. Um, so did people hear the question? I'm not sure. Did I repeat the question? You didn't, but he had a mic. Oh, you had a mic. Okay, good. Uh, just want to make sure I'm not confusing everyone to death by what I'm saying. Uh, so uh, when, a new, when a discipline adopts a new set of tools, they often adopt them without thinking very hard about how they apply in your setting versus other settings. And indeed, I think uh, the economists have been uh, far too willing to accept the lab as a way to study things. So what we find in the lab is we find uh, all sorts of uh, results. But uh, typically what we find is incredible amounts of what seems to be altruism. Uh, people willing to give away tons of money to other people uh, uh, in, in, sh in ways that shock and even dismay economists, I would say, because it just doesn't make any sense. So there's a, uh, you know, uh, to give you an example, um, there's a game called the ultimatum game which uh, is a simple game which people uh, play in a way which completely goes against economic principles. Uh, the game is this. You bring two college students into the lab, and one of the college, they're both given, say, $10. Okay? And then the, the one of the chosen at random, one of the college students is given an extra $10 and is allowed to split that money between themselves and the other student however they would like. Okay? Uh, it's all anonymous. It's a one-shot game. You'll never meet the person. Okay? And then the other person, the recipient, then has a choice. Do I accept the share that the economist gave me, or do I turn it down? In case I turn it down, all of the money gets wiped away. Okay, so, so that extra $10 that's given, so let's say the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the person making the choice, the ultimatum giver, says, I want to keep seven, you get three. Okay, then I can just say, I'll take the three, you get the seven, or say, no, we both get zero. Okay, that I'd rather have nothing than let you walk away with seven when I have three. Okay. Now, it turns out when economists solve this model, the answer is that um, the first person should say, okay, we've been given $10, and I'm going to keep $9.99, and I'm going to give you a penny. And the other person will say, well, thank you very much. That was kind of you to leave me the penny. A penny is better than nothing. We'll split the money that way. That's fine. Okay. That's what economic models say should happen. It just never, ever happens in the lab. Okay. If you give the person less than about $3 out of the 10, they're furious, and they, they wipe you away, and they say you get nothing. What if you all. do the experiment in an in a undergrad economics department? Uh, it's, even this one, so undergrad econ majors are closer to what you'd expect, OK? But still, even undergrad econ majors uh, defy the rules of economics, and they're still willing to, to give away some money. OK. So this has really changed the way economists think. Okay? And the power of the lab, you control the agenda, and you really, you're the, you're the, you're the person pulling the levers. Okay? So then uh, it turns out that some clever economists got together a bunch of anthropologists. Okay? And there's a set of anthropologists who go around the world, and they go into you know, indigenous groups, 
as part of their PhD thesis, and they learn the language and the culture, and they write their, their great book about how this, you know, you know, uh, this group of um, you know, hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari Desert works, okay, and then they get their job on the tenure track. They invest all that time, and then they have to write a second book, right? And, and, uh, and they can't think of what to do. They've spent all this time, they wrote about this side, they got nothing left to do, but they, they, they don't want to start over from scratch. So they were willing, as much as they hate economists, to be trained by the economists to play the games like the ultimatum game, and then to go out into their, uh, into their, you know, their hunter-gatherer tribe and play the games to see how they played so that they could all write this paper together. Okay? What it turned out is that, just as the questioner suggested, uh, how different groups played the game uh, shocked everybody. Because every Western society you go to plays the, this, the ultimate game the same. But in, in just to give the craziest example, there was one group they went to, and this was a group in Mongolia, where almost every time the, the person who made the ultimatum offered well more than half of the gift, and every single time, so they offered more than half, they kept less than half, and they gave more than half to the other person, and almost every time, the recipient declined the offer and said, I would rather have zero than more than half of the gift that you gave. Okay, which is completely puzzling until you understand the society. It turns out this was a society that was based on, had, had no, a norm of competitive gift giving. Okay? So if you gave a gift to someone today, they were morally obligated within that society to give back a bigger gift in the future. Okay? So these people were like, when, when, <laughs> when faced with the offer of a gift, they're like, oh my god, I do not want this gift. It's easier to refuse the gift than to take it. <laughs> now, even though this was a, supposedly a one-shot game and anonymous, and so it shouldn't, that's not the way it should play it. But what we really learned, and it really gets to the question, and, and every society they went to, you could map from the way the culture worked to the way they played these lab games. Okay? And, and you actually learned less, in some sense, about culture. And what you really learned is that the lab isn't doing at all what you think it's doing. Because we want to believe as scientists that when you go to the lab, you control everything. But it turns out you don't. The most important thing for how lab experiments turn out is the, the norms and the rules of thumb that people bring from outside the lab, and they bring those into the lab, and that's the culture. And that's exactly what the lab is designed to get rid of, right? You're, if you're in control, you're the one pulling the levers, you can't have people bring in the rules of thumb. And it's actually been really the centerpiece, in my belief, of the end, not the end, but really the diminution of the use of the lab in economics, which offered such you know, optimistic, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, a vision for how we could do research, and I think that's been uh, been completely squashed. Do we have time for maybe one more question? I think. Yeah, I take one more question. I'm going to end it with a quick. I'll take it from this young lady here. There was a recent study that delineated uh, the amount of annual salary for happiness, seventy-five thousand. Like and at around the same time, there was another study that indicated that folks who made a little bit less annually, donated and contributed and were more altruistic than those who you know, made over, I don't know if it was 75, there are two different studies. I just was interested in your thoughts on that factor. So, you know, happiness is a great topic for researchers and it's a really hard topic for researchers too. A little bit for the reasons that I was talking about before, which is how do you measure happiness? Right? It'd be great if you could stick a needle in somebody and get their happiness quotient, but you, you can't do it. So a lot of it is self-reported. And so for years, uh, people like him, economists particularly, have complained that it's ridiculous to ask people, you know, how happy are you on a scale of what? So there's been some refinement of that, like a guy, Danny Kahneman, who's a psychologist who's won a Nobel in economics, who's done very interesting research moved it a little bit forward by at least giving people um, kind of you know, wireless devices so that they could page them at any moment. Say, at this moment, on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you feel about relation to this and that? So at least then you're not getting an answer in the penumbra of you know, memory and things like that. But it's still a really hard thing. I think the central insight th that we've got so far from a lot of research that's going on, and to me it's kind of in its infancy. So there's like an fMRI, functional magnetic Reson resonance imaging idea, where you put somebody in an x-ray, a living, a, a moving x-ray machine, and can look at different parts of their brain as you show them different images, give them different amounts of money, show them pictures of people they love and hate. And it's kind of neat, but it's very, very r rudimentary. I think that, to me, the most convincing piece that we know about happiness, especially when it comes to money, is that most people think that their happiness is on an absolute scale. In other words, I 
me, this person that I've always been, and I'm happy on a scale of zero to 100 at some point, and it wavers, obviously, and we think that. And if we can only get up to 90%, then everything will be great. And here's what I have to do to get up to 90%. But what that ignores is that even though we think our happiness is built on absolute, it's really built on relative. And that is the big problem that so many people have such a hard time. So there are studies that show that, again, this is if you ask people. So I would, I would take this with a grain of salt. Would you rather earn $40,000 when everyone around you is earning uh, 45 or 35 when everyone around you is earning 32? A lot of people answer they'd rather earn 35. They'd rather have a little bit more than that. So that relative worth and relative happiness is so intense even for people who have a great, great deal of money, as we know. So I was writing once about Steven Spielberg. I spent like a week with him in his office in Los Angeles. And it was a very fascinating guy, very humane, smart guy. And one day, he was um, bidding on some lamps, some Tiffany lamps through Christie's. It was a, a phone auction, Christie's in New York. And there were these four lamps that he wanted to buy. He'd marked out of the catalog. And he'd been waiting for this for like a year. He loves these lamps. He already owned like 14. And, um, the first two, he bid up a little bit, and he didn't want to spend. He didn't want to spend like eighty thousand, which you know he's worth two billion dollars. So it's really hard to say why spend eighty thousand on one and not on another. And then he gets the third lamp, but he didn't feel good about it because it was just kind of a cheap one. It was like thirty grand or forty grand, and the one that he really wanted w was estimated to sell for a million and a half dollars. And that was the one. It was the best one, and that was the one he really wanted. And so I'm sitting there with him, and he's on the phone with the Christie's clerk, and the bidding starts, and he's in, and he's in a little bit, and he's in a little bit, and then he stops, and he drops out well before it got to a million and a half. And he told me he'd probably bid $2 million for it. And he stopped. And I said, what's going on? And he, he looked down at the catalog, and he had noticed something in the catalog that he hadn't seen before. It said, this lamp is being sold by the estate of or by David Geffen. Now, David Geffen turns out to be one of Steven Spielberg's closest friends, OK? He was thinking now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's a guy who was prepared to spend $2 million on a lamp, and all of a sudden, he doesn't want the lamp anymore because it was being sold by a friend. He's saying, I'm not going to give $2 million to my friend Geffen because he's going to lord it over me for the rest of his life and say, oh, I only paid 50 grand for that thing. I can't believe you paid $2 million. <laughs> if it had been anybody else on Earth, Steven Spielberg would have bought the lamp for $2 million. But because it was somebody he knew, he wouldn't do it. So that, to me, it's all about our relative happiness or value against other people as opposed to what's really absolute. Because honestly, even $2 million to Steven Spielberg is like the equivalent for most of us, literally like $100 or $1,000. It was almost meaningless in absolute terms. But in relative terms, it was everything. So, Levitt, you got a story? Yeah, I'll tell, let, me end, let me have one quick, quick story. Um, so when uh, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the best things that's come out of Freakonomics is that uh, you get to talk to crowds and uh, and meet people and who have ideas and data and, and want to uh, kind of be part of the research process. And so one of the most interesting emails that I ever got uh, came, uh, came from a, a young woman uh, who wrote me. And she had, uh, uh, well, her email said, I understand uh, that from a mutual acquaintance of ours that uh, you're doing some research on prostitution in the city of Chicago, which indeed was true, that I had a new product that I just started maybe you know, three weeks earlier, in which we were putting trackers out on the street corners to, uh, and, just to, uh, in, and in brothels. We paid the prostitutes a little bit, and they would just record all the information from each trick that they were doing. So the lady went, uh, I myself am a high-priced escort in the city of Chicago. Uh, which made me wonder which of our mutual acquaintances uh, got paid enough to, uh, <laughs> to uh, have passed along this information. Uh, and she said, I have a Palm Pilot that has all the data on all the clients I've ever served. Is that the kind of information you're trying to gather? And I wrote her back immediately, and I said, absolutely, that's the kind of information I'm trying to gather. Uh, and then she wrote me back and said, well, let's meet uh, for brunch next week and talk about uh, how I can give you this data for your, for your research purposes. And I said, great. Now, I had a small problem, which is that I have a, a wife and four young children. And it took a little bit of explaining to my wife to uh, say that uh, I was going to have brunch with a prostitute. And I said, I swear to God, she called me. I did not call her. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, my wife was accepting. And uh, I went to meet this lady. And she turned out to be a fascinating lady. So she had uh, a college degree. 
Uh, she was a, a computer programmer. Uh, she had actually served in the military, uh, worked on the Star Wars missile defense system, programming that up, before she then later uh, went on to uh, work for one of the, you know, the largest companies in America as a computer programmer, making 80 grand a year. So everything seemed good, except she decided that being a prostitute would be a better career for her than working in corporate America. And she used those very skills, uh, the programming skills that she had been honing to make her own website. And within just uh, two to three months of getting started in her new profession, uh, she was making about $250,000 a year, working about 20, maybe 25 hours a week. And she couldn't have been happier at the turn, you know, the turn of events that, that her life had, uh, had taken. So we got to brunch, and uh, she explained her life story to me. And then she, uh, you know, we talked about the data. And all of that took about 15 minutes. And uh, here we were at brunch, probably another half an hour we we're going to spend together. And I'm pretty socially awkward to begin with. And I'm thinking, what in the world are we going to talk about, me and this prostitute, for the next 30 minutes? And because Freakonomics had been a successful business book, I had been called by lots of CEOs. And uh, I had had the opportunity to interview a bunch of CEOs and talk to them about their business. And I figured, well, I'm just going to kill the time by asking the same set of questions that I asked the CEOs and hope that that can take us to the end of the, uh, the, the end of brunch. And uh, it turned out that I asked her those same questions I asked the CEOs. And uh, uh, indeed, I think she gave me better answers than the <laughs> CEOs did to many of those questions. She had a really thorough understanding of how her industry worked. But I finally managed to trip her up. I asked her, how'd you set your prices? And she said, God, I had no idea what price to charge. And so you know, I just went on the internet, and I looked at what the other women were charging. And a bunch of them were charging $300 an hour. So I decided to charge $300, too. OK, so that, that infuriates an economist. Because of all the things economists know how to do, it's to set prices. right? If you've even taken introductory economics, you've been exposed to the inverse elasticity rule of pricing. right? If you know the elasticity of demand, and you know your marginal cost, that's all you need to know to set optimal prices. Okay? And what infuriated me was, OK, I didn't maybe expect a prostitute to know how to do this, but I've talked to probably 40 businesses. And not once has a single business I've talked to ever set prices in that manner. Okay? And it's just, you just it, it, to someone like me who tries to bring economics into the real world, it's amazing that the gap between the way, economics, the way economists think the world should work and the way it actually works are so, you know, so far apart. So I thought, well, how, how could I know whether she's charging the right prices? She clearly would only by luck could she be charging the right price. And then I, I hit on exactly the right question to ask her. Uh, and I, uh, she had a dedicated phone line, a phone line that only her clients called her on. And I said, how do you feel when the phone rings? She thought about it and she said, you know, I really don't care that much whether the phone rings. You know, uh, I'm kind of indifferent. In fact, sometimes I don't even pick up the phone when it rings. And I said, you're a local monopolist. You have a downward sloping demand curve. That means if you could sell one more unit of your good at the same price as the previous units, you would be dying to do it. The fact that you're indifferent means you can't possibly be charging a high enough price. She looked at me befuddled, as many of you seem to be looking at me right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, okay, I'm, I wasn't here to maximize her profits. I was just trying to get her palm pot. So I wasn't worried about it. You know, We parted ways. And I didn't think I'd ever see this uh, nice young woman again. But, uh, I teach the undergrads at the University of Chicago a course on economics of crime. And uh, I'd never lectured before on prostitution, but now I was doing this research, I thought, well, maybe I should add a prostitution lecture. It was hard to write a le good lecture. And as I struggled to try and figure out what to say, I, it hit me. Why am I bothering to write this lecture when I could just get the expert to come in and guest lecture for me to my students? And I called this young woman on the phone, Allie, and I said, hey, I was wondering if you could come down and teach my class for me. And said, oh, I'm a very private person. I am a terrible public speaker. I could never do this. OK, but the thing is, I've been around a lot of economists and a handful of prostitutes. And I know there's this one important similarity <laughs> between the two. Okay? And that similarity is that there's nothing about can't. Okay? It's just get to the right price. right? There's just, you're willing to do it. It's just got to figure out what the price you'll do it at. Okay? And so um, I said, well, what if I paid you your hourly wage to, uh, to teach my class? She said, oh, oh, I didn't understand what you were talking about before. <laughs> Over my hourly wage, that would be wonderful. You just tell me the time I need to be there. Be happy to teach your class. Okay, so she came down to the university, and she gave the lecture, and it was spectacular. It was fantastic. A third of my students, when I asked them later, said that it was the single best lecture they had been to in their entire four years at the University of Chicago. 
which is a pretty sad statement about what me and my colleagues are doing in the classroom, but, but maybe not in an accurate one. After her prepared remarks, we did Q&A. Uh, and one of the students raised his hands. And he said, how much do you charge? And she said, I charge $400 an hour. Okay? And I become furious, right? Because <laughs> in our bargaining, I was like trying to be delicate. And I said I would just charge, you know, I'd pay her her hourly wage, okay? which I knew to be $300 an hour. And I thought, you know, we had this, I thought we had some sort of relationship. But then she's like, you know, lying. And you just can't trust a prostitute about anything, OK? And, <laughs> And I'm, and I'm furious because it's not like I can go to the National Science Foundation and say, you know, I'm too lazy to write my own lectures, so I'm going to need an extra $400 in grant money to pay the prostitute who I hired to teach the classroom. So it's coming right out of my pocket. So I'm absolutely seething about the fact that she's, you know, she's lying, trying to extract this extra 100 bucks. And then the next student raises her hand. And she says, well, how did you decide how much to charge? And, um, and the prostitute, she turns, I'm sitting there, she turns to me. She, big beaming smile on her face. She says, we know, the very first time that I was with Professor Levitt. <laughs> she, says, she says, the very first time that I was with Professor Levitt, he convinced me my services were far more valuable than the $300 I was currently charging. So I raised my prices to $400, and it's the best business decision I've ever made in my life. So I don't know. I couldn't turn out to be Alan Greenspan, but if any of you have friends who are prostitutes, I guarantee I can add to their bottom line. So send them my way. So thank you very much.